know, so that watch at a later time. Um, just to get us going, we are going to watch a brief video about the Office of Victim Advocate and victims' rights. So let's watch this. The Office of Victim Advocate is the state agency with the duty and authority to advocate for the rights of crime survivors. Pennsylvania state law recognizes that victims of crime have rights. You have the right to be told about basic services available to you in your county, court events including information on bail, escape or release of offender, preliminary hearings, trials, guilty pleas, sentencing, and the details of the final disposition of a case. You have the right to receive notice of the arrest of the offender, information about restitution and assistance with compensation, accompaniment to all criminal proceedings by a family member, a victim advocate, or a support person. You have the right to offer comment before the sentencing decision and to receive help in preparing a verbal or written victim impact statement, and also before post-sentencing decisions, including parole consideration, pardons and clemency, medical or compassionate release. At the Office of Victim Advocate, we work with crime victims to make sure their rights are upheld as they navigate their way through the complex legal system in a manner that recognizes trauma and how it impacts our lives. We encourage crime survivors to register for services with the Office of Victim Advocate. Benefits of registration include awareness. The Office of Victim Advocate will help keep you informed of an individual's movements throughout the state correctional system. Assistance. The Office of Victim Advocate will assist you in preparing statements and comments before the PA Parole Board and the PA Board of Pardons. Advocacy. The Office of Victim Advocate operates a call center to answer your questions and advocate on your behalf. Access. The Office of Victim Advocate offers several special projects to build resiliency and support the healing process like resilient voices, support groups, victim offender dialogue, inmate apology bank, impact of crime courses and trauma trainings, as well as numerous efforts to support crime prevention and restorative justice as we work collaboratively with local county service providers to build safer, caring communities where justice thrives. All right, so at any time during the discussion, if you have comments or questions, please um, put those in the chat and we'll make sure we get to those. Um, it's important that we acknowledge that um, crime victims' rights are not new to Pennsylvania. Um, they've been a part of the law in Pennsylvania for quite some time. But unlike the rights that are available to the accused, crime victims' rights um, have not been given that same level of importance that we often hear of. Um, for example, I'm sure everyone is familiar with the rights that um, the accused have, like the right to remain silent or the right to be represented by an attorney. We hear those over and over again. And while um, victims' rights are not as popular, they are equally as important. Um, so this kind of, uh, those main rights that we kind of saw in the video and what we're looking at, and that's going to, the detail of the list of rights in the statute is going to be put in the chat so that you can have that for your reference. But it kind of can be summed up in the right to be informed, the right to be heard, the right to be accompanied, and the right to be restored. Now, when we talk about uh, Act 77 and this new idea of legal standing, it's not like we're talking about different rights. They're the same rights that have been in the, uh, the laws of Pennsylvania, but now there's a remedy if your right is uh, violated or ignored. And we hear that a lot in victim services where people will say, um, uh, I didn't get any information on when the trial date was, or uh, they entered a plea and no one told me anything about it. So if things like that were to happen, now with this new opportunity for legal standing, victims actually have access. And what that's supposed to mean is that you have a way to address the court about the violation. 
Now, because it's so new, and that's kind of um, the difference that we see with the rights that are afforded to uh, offenders, they're not new. So there's lots of case law explaining um, how the right should be upheld and what happens if the right is not upheld and why those rights are so important. And at this point, we don't have that yet for crime victims' rights. So it's a little bit, um, I don't know whether tricky is the right word, but it's a little difficult to assert standing and to make sure um, that you do receive the rights that the statute says you're entitled to as a victim of crime. One of the ways that our office helps is through our um, compliance project. And a form um, that you would need to fill out to work with us is gonna be also placed in the chat. But what happens here when a survivor says, hey, one of my rights have been violated. And again, those are the rights that are listed in the statute. Uh, once that happens, you can contact the Office of Victim Advocate and fill out this form. And once you let us know that you want us to advocate on your behalf, um, we'll kind of ask you for more information, make sure we get all the details of what happened in the case. And then once you say we can advocate on your behalf, we'll try to work collaboratively to see if there's a way that we might be able to get um, whether it's judges, law enforcement, um, district attorneys to, to recognize that a right has been violated and see what they can do, what remedy they're going to offer. Uh, we approach it from the standpoint that everyone wants to um, make sure that victims' rights are honored. So uh, we go in with that assumption of like, hey, did you, there must be a misstep that you didn't recognize that um, this, this part didn't occur. So we approach it from that standpoint and try to work collaboratively to make sure that um, victims' rights are upheld. And sometimes uh, we, have, we have quite a bit of success um, working in that way and getting things um, resolved. For example, uh, we had one case where, and it involved uh, parents with their children and uh, juvenile involved, but the parent had, had been working with a particular advocate at, for her child. And she wanted that advocate to accompany the child to the court hearing where the judge had asked that only the advocate that they work with in the courthouse, kind of through the victim witness office um, was gonna be allowed. And they kind of like had made an exclusion for what the parent had selected. So, um, and then they called us kind of like right away while the process was still going on. And we were able to reach out to the judge and discuss the fact that per the statute, the victim has the right to the advocate of their choice. And um, it wasn't that the judge was thinking, you know, I'm just gonna violate this right. The judge was literally thinking of ways to kind of provide protections for the children and thinking that um, if they only use the courthouse advocate, that they would keep this information um, more um, centered and there wouldn't be any leaks in the community and things of that nature. But when we were able to point out that this was a victim right and the victim had the right to choose their advocate, um, the judge was willing to accommodate that. So um, that's kind of a an example of how we see that work and collaboration is key. Uh, we're working um, all across with different agencies who speak to um, the rights of victims to try to bring this together. And that's another um, kind of part of the process is that the victim's rights appear at so many different points of the criminal process. So um, it's a, it crosses many different state agencies and community agencies that have a particular right that they're responsible for. For example, at the time of an arrest, the officer should be providing the victim with information. So um, that's an important piece um, that should also occur. And at different stages of the process all along, there are different rights that come into play and different parties that are responsible for that right. So we do try to work to collaborate amongst all of them to make sure um, that the victim's rights are upheld. Another one um, that we saw, uh, and then this is particular to what's um, written in the statute. And this is um, commonly referred to as Act 77, but this is where uh, it appears in the statute that the, com the district attorney can actually file a motion on behalf of the victim to assert standing on their behalf. Uh, now, this is really 
I know sometimes the, from the victim standpoint, um, it's kind of difficult to understand all the players and what player is actually on the side of the victim because the victim does not, the, the district attorney does not represent the victim, but they, rec they represent the state. So the, the victim is never actually a party to the case, but because they have such an important role in the case, um, they have these rights by statute. So if a time, if at any point during the case, the victim right has been violated, the Commonwealth, which would commonly be the district attorney's office, could file the motion for on behalf of the victim to make sure that that right is upheld. And I have another example of where we saw this come into play in, in Adams County. And like I said, because it's so new and there's no case law actually saying this is how it should work, this is what they're entitled to, this is what should happen, um, it's, it's a little bit different. We're all kind of at the the um, the beginning stage of framing, helping to frame this and helping to make sure that it's done in a way that's really supportive of victims and what um, what victims need. So in this case, um, and these were all adults, uh, they were in court and at one point the judge cleared the courtroom and the victim and everyone left and it was just the prosecutor, the defense attorney and the offender there in the courtroom and they had this discussion and decided on a plea and then um, kind of dismissed for the day. And later on, the victim was told, oh, well, um, the judge accepted a plea and kind of, you know, this case is over. So, and unfortunately, but we kind of see that happen um, far too often. But now that victims have standing, there's an opportunity to object to that and say, hey, that should not have been done that way. So, and then the sooner the person reaches out to our office and files that complaint form, not that that's the only way it can be done, because clearly the victim can assert these rights on their own. But if they use that step and they get to us sooner rather than later, it gives us more of an opportunity to kind of get involved, get something to happen before um, the process is so far beyond that no one wants to disturb it and try to um, input what should have happened previously. But in this case, we were able to um, speak to the district attorney, and this was in Adams County. And it was really, they admitted that it was just an oversight, that it was not their intention um, to violate, that it happened so quickly that it was almost like it just kind of slipped their mind that the victim had not made their impact statement. So they did file a motion on behalf of the victim and asked that um, they have the opportunity to present their impact statement. And the judge entered an order saying that they should be able to make the impact statement, set time for that, and um, was the victim felt empowered and that that right had then been upheld. So this is the only um, time that I'm aware of that a motion has been used so far since the passage of Act 77. But just an example of that whole collaborative piece that it was easier to do because the um, district attorney's office was willing to do that. And the statute clearly says that they can do that on behalf of the victim. So I'm going to stop the screen share. And then um, does anybody have any questions, anything in the chat about that so far? No questions in the chat at this time. All right. Okay. So um, I also just want to make sure that uh, we understand, and it's important for, for us as service providers to be able to clearly convey this to um, victims, because I think um, just the whole understanding of trauma and how that sits with survivors, just the understanding that um, the players in the process might not always be clear. So making sure that survivors understand that they're not a party to the case, that victims' rights do not mean that they can determine what the final outcome of the case should be, that the rights are really limited to those that are um, enumerated in the statute. And while they can um, make input and give comment, it is still their, their comment and their input is not the final say. 
So, and that that can be a difficult, um, you know, piece to swallow. Um, it could, I get that it can seem unfair. So I think it's important that while we are elevating victims' rights and the importance of victims' rights, that we make it clear kind of the limitations that those rights kind of sit with. Okay, so um, at this point, I am going to um, open it up to my friends, Andrea and Conrad from the Legal Assistance Project at the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape. I'm going to ask you each to kind of introduce yourselves and then um, um, describe the project for us and tell us a little bit about what you guys do. My name is Andrea Levy. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, I'm the legal director of the Sexual Violence Legal Assistance Project at the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape. So that is um, my role. And I will um, kick it to Conrad, my, um, my fellow uh, lawyer. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Conrad Jarzina, and I'm a staff attorney with the project that Andrea just uh, described and been here for about three and a half years now. Yeah, our project um, began in 2018, um, so it is five years old, and um, we provide free legal representation to survivors of sexual violence across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, not, you know, there, there are certain legal um, matters that we are able to provide representation for under the terms of our grant. And I mean, I don't know if Suzanne would like us to discuss that more, but um, our project is here to help uh, survivors of sexual assault um, accomplish what they want to legally. And sometimes that does include um, when they are involved in the criminal justice system. Right. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good point to, or a good time to point out that a lot of the work that you all do deals with um, civil claims and not um, criminal claims. So just um, letting the audience be aware of the fact that there, there are those differences and those um, opportunities if you have some civil claims that you want to pursue versus being involved in um, criminal prosecution. Um, tell us a little bit about the um, sexual violence protection orders, because I'm still hearing from counties um, across the Commonwealth that they're so rarely used. So tell us like what that is, how somebody would qualify and what that process would look like. Okay, uh, so sexual violence protection order to which we refer as an SVPO is uh, very similar to protection from abuse order, if anyone is familiar with that. And in essence, uh, if, if an order is granted, um, what, uh, what it entails is 30, it's uh, for up to 36 months, uh, the defendant or the, the abuser uh, perpetrator is not to have any contact whatsoever with the petitioner. Uh, a victim or survivor in that case. Uh, and what that means, basically no contact. So no direct contact, no indirect contact, no text messaging, no social media, no contact through third parties. And uh, uh, also no harassment, stalking. And if that order is violated, uh, the defendant would be facing up to six months in prison and a $1,000 fine. Um, so basically, as far as the process, uh, if someone is a victim of sexual assault, uh, can file a petition at the local courthouse. Uh, most of the courthouses have what they call PFA offices, but they typically will assist uh, with filing of, of, a, of an SVPO. Um, the statute of limitations for filing is uh, six years. Um, and uh, of course, it's better to file sooner than later. However, uh, Suzanne mentioned not many people are familiar with that. So a lot of times when the question was raised, why did you wait so long? Our answer would be because my client didn't, wasn't aware of this uh, until uh, we got in touch and, 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 and spoke about that op option. Uh, another example of like late, late filing is for example, you know, you moved and uh, uh, all of a sudden the perpetrator just pops up in your neighborhood and, and that person moved closer to you and you can then justify and say 
that you know I was fine. I felt that you know I was two three hours away, didn't need it, but now I feel that uh, that I need it. Um, in order to well, let me go back to the process. So once once a petition is filed, uh, typically the same day, uh, the petitioner will go in front of the judge. Um, just ex parte, meaning the defendant is not there. It's just uh, the petitioner and the judge, or myself, or an advocate uh, that is there with uh, her or him. And uh, uh, the judge will review the petition and decide whether a temporary order is warranted. In the majority of the cases, if, if the petition is, states the basic, ba basic uh, grounds for, for relief, uh, the temporary order will be granted and a hearing will be scheduled. Uh, the statute says should be within 10 days. Typically, the courts file that, but there are some extenuating circumstances where it cannot be done. Uh, but the, the hearings are usually scheduled very, very quickly. And then tell uh, us before you before you move on, tell us what are the basic grounds that the person would need to be able to state for to yeah, get the order. Sure. So so uh, with SVPOs, it's, it's two things. First, you have to assert that um, or petition has to assert that the peti petitioner uh, was a victim of a sexual offense, and that the, the act has uh, a list of offenses that basically makes a reference to the criminal code. Uh, so you don't have to prove it like, you know, in criminal cases, you have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt here. It's just you have to credibly assert it. And the second prong is uh, uh, you have to prove by preponderance of the evidence, which is the lowest burden of proof that we have in the legal system. So like the scale has to tip slightly towards you that you are the continuous risk of harm. What's important to point out about that is you don't have to prove that there is a risk that this particular person is going to do the same thing or is going to sexually assault you. The, the risk of harm could be just uh, encountering or having to deal with this person, just uh, being triggered by seeing that person. Uh, if, you know, this person may be showing up at your place of employment, uh, not even for in bad faith, but, uh, but let's say you work at uh, library or uh, a store and this person just frequents those places so so uh so continuous risk of harm is more like i would say on the emotional impact of having to interact directly or indirectly with that person uh so so those are the two basic requirements that you need to establish in order to uh for your petition to be granted I just want to add one thing that, that Conrad had mentioned that a sexual violence protection order is very similar to a PFA. Um, and there's the difference between the two that's important is the relationship between the parties. So if um, the survivor is sexually assaulted by um, a family member or intimate partner, that would be under the PFA side. If you are the survivor of a sexual assault that occurred from any other person who is not an intimate partner, who's not a family or household member, um, say it's like um, someone that you work with or someone you met up with um, at a social gathering and then they assaulted you, then it would be a sexual violence protection order. So that's how uh, the determination is made, uh, which type of um, no contact order that you would seek. It depends upon the relationship between the parties. And the other important difference between the two statutes, so both you could get a 36 month stay away order if you are successful, if you are the petitioner. The, uh, the big difference also is um, with the PFA, there within that statute, there is a mechanism for firearms relinquishment. Um, and the SVPO, stay away order, there is not. There is no way to, um, to uh, for the court statutorily to order a defendant in an SVPO um, setting to relinquish firearms. Okay. I see, Becky, you wanted to ask a question? Yes, thank you. Um, with regards to the relationship with the PFA versus the SVPO, um, I heard you say household member is that open to interpretation depending on the judges you have in your county, or is that a known with the SVP in particularly that could be a household member and it's not up for debate? 
But in the law, everything's up for debate, right? I mean, so like you can make an argument and sometimes that's like such an astute question because those are the questions that we receive. Like, where do I go with this? Is it a PFA or is it an SVPO? So those are oftentimes close questions and you have to make an argument before the court. I mean, the definition is in the statute and the definition is identical in the PFA statute and the SVPO statute. Family or household member, Sp is defined spouses or persons who have been spouses, persons living as spouses or who lived as spouses, parents and children and other persons um, who are related, current or former sexual intimate partners or persons who share biological parenthood. So the, both statutes have the exact same definition and it PFA is like uh, the parties must be family or household members to qualify under that statute's protections. SVPO says you may not be family or household members to qualify under the protections of the SVPO statute. And, you know, you're right. Sometimes it is sort of a muddy call and there's not a whole lot of case law for the courts interpreting that. Um, and, and Conrad mentioned that the SVPO statute and Suzanne did as well, isn't always used as frequently or as known, I should say, as frequently as the PFA statute. And that's one of the reasons is it's it, it was enacted in, I believe, 2015. So it's much newer than um, the PFA statute. So I think that does contribute to the fact that um, persons in the community and even sometimes, literally, even sometimes law enforcement and courthouse personnel are not fully aware that this is um, uh, something that can be used for survivors to help protect them. Mm -hmm. Good point. Um, Conrad, do you want to tell us a little bit about, or Andrea, about the, the hearing process after they get that temporary, what could the survivor expect from the hearing process? Sure. So as, as far as the hearing, a number of things that can happen, because basically that's the first chance uh, for your petitioner, uh, hopefully represented by an attorney or strongly encouraged to be represented by an attorney um, whenever possible. That's the first opportunity for the, for your attorney to speak either directly with the defendant um, or uh, defendant's counsel. So uh, a lot of times you are able to reach an agreement and most of the most of the agreements that we see is basically a consent order for a period of time. Obviously, we want 36 months most of the time, but it depends on the client. We can negotiate it down a little bit. Um, and uh, and this would be a consent order without admission. So in other words, the defendant is not admitting to the allegations, but is agreeing to an order being entered as a final order. Um, of course, if the defendant doesn't show up, then typically just have a default order, uh, unless some judges will, if there's a question about service or timing of the service, some, some judges may reschedule it, just to be fair. And, uh, and, and then uh, if, no agreement can be reached then you have a hearing so basically as a petitioner the burden of proof is on you and uh, uh you most likely be asked to well you will be asked to testify uh pretty much about what you alleged in the petition but of course there is only so much room to to um tell the judge what happened and then of course as far as the continuous risk of harm that's really a good opportunity at the hearing to to explain to the judge to basically look, you know, ju judge directly and just show what kind of uh, impact and encounters with this particular per persons have on you. Uh, of course, if you have witnesses, you know, with SVPOs, that's the nature of the crime. You usually don't have many witnesses, but sometimes you, you can have witnesses that maybe uh, first person you reached out to following a, an assault uh, the, that can describe, you know, a, a, your emotional state at that time, uh, corroborate your story that you shared immediately after. Um, and other than that's testimonial evidence, you can present uh, other forms of evidence. So if there are any communications uh, before and after. So sometimes you have a situation that like, yes, you can come over, but do not expect anything happening. We're just going to watch a movie, you know? So that would be circumstantial, but, but, but good evidence. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the communication after the fact too, where once in a while, actually, I shouldn't say once in a while, there are a lot of times you will, you will, not a lot of times, but you frequently see some kind of apology or some vague apology or 
you know, taking ownership, like, you know, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know, or I, you know, things of that nature that can also corroborate uh, that there was no consent. Uh, this was not uh, any conduct that was, you know, solicited or welcomed. Um, and, um, and of course, then the defendant has a, you know, the defense attorney has an opportunity to cross examine the petitioner and uh, any witnesses there presented and then uh, defendant uh, can also testify. So um, uh, the reason why I mentioned earlier, we have decent amount of agreements is because uh, uh, a lot of cases at that time, you know, are reported to the law enforcement. So they're being investigated. And, and most of the attorneys having a defendant who is under the investigation, regardless of what they tell you in court, regardless of their story uh, or excuses, will advise the defendant not to testify uh, because that's under oath, on the record, and can and will be used against that person potentially. Mm -hmm. um so so uh that's a that's good because then you don't have to you know just it's it's stressful enough to have gone through that whole experience it even led you to file file the petition and then so fairly quickly to to have to encounter the person be be cross-examined so it's really nice when we are able to get those agreements and just uh uh avoid the hearing altogether and i would say it's uh this my experience uh, a significant percentage of these cases get resolved. Uh, so if, you know, someone is nervous about filing, I would say, even sometimes when I talk to clients who just basically say, I'm, I just cannot go through the hearing, my advice will still be, well, let's file. You know, you can always just like withdraw last minute and, you know, you can sit, we'll have you sit in another room, let me talk to them. Because if we can get an agreement or, or something or even, continue it out for six months because let's say you're planning on moving, you know, or trying to just get your, uh, get a new place and just move somewhere else. It's just like, let's, let's, let's go for it because the chances are we can have an agreement. Maybe someone will, will not show up. Uh, so even if like, I totally understand this is a scary experience, but um, I, there are options. You're a petitioner. So you're kind of, you're in charge. You, no one can force you then to, to testify. No one can force you to pursue it. He, I, I could go in front of the judge and say, my client just decided to withdraw it. If someone was just not willing to, not wanting to have, have to go through the hearing, but uh, but we wanted to just just file and, and just at least have a dialogue and see if we can get the, get the case resolved. That's a great strategy. I like that. We got a question in the chat. Does can a victim file on file one while pursuing criminal charges? Could the time frame be extended through judicial proceedings, or is the order of protection automatic in those occurrences? Mm -hmm. I think you touched on some of it, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, if if the if the criminal charges were filed, um, then uh, typically SVPO is not necessary because if if uh, if the defendant appeared in front of the judge for a preliminary arraignment. Uh, that's when they set the bail and bail conditions. So if the person is released, then one of the conditions of bail would be no contact with the victim. And, and typically the defendants who, you know, just basically get, are getting out of the courtroom, uh, being happy that the judge was even willing to impose low bail, just, just release them, uh, will not take chances. And basically, if they violate, they're in jail. The bail is revoked and they're in jail, in jail waiting um, trial. Uh, however, with SVPOs, the reality is that uh, criminal charges are very, not, not filed in most of the cases, I hate to say. Uh, and even if they are, it's something, it will take months and months because if, let's say, you did the rape kit. I mean, the wait time can be months and months and months. So uh, uh, I typically advise, you know, clients to just file for SVPO. Uh, if the charges are filed, the SVPO, filing of SVPO is not going to really affect your criminal charges or make the district attorney suspicious of anything. It's it's just natural that you wanted protection and no contact uh, while you're waiting to hear from the law enforcement. If uh, if later on you know the person is charged and convicted, then you have you know double protection, if you will. You you have the civil side protection as VPO, and then you have criminal side 
protection will be just uh, uh, just a bail condition. Okay, um, and we have another question. Could one be filed for others associated with the offender? Uh, like against someone who is associated with the offender? Mm -hmm. No, unless that person, unless you, you would be able to allege, allege that uh, there was criminal conspiracy, you know, so if you, someone associated with the offender would be, is, is tricky because it's a very broad term. So if it's a criminal conspirator who also would be, you know, conspired as far as the, the assault itself, I would say yes. You could make an argument that uh, the dead person is responsible for the underlying crime you're you're uh, you're basing your petition on. But if it's just like a third party that is basically like a, a his friend or acquaintance or family member who is just harassing you, etc., um, you could not file against that person. But what we do though, uh, when we get that SVPO. I make sure either I ask the, the opposing attorney or if there's no attorney, I talk directly to the defender to understand that, you know, you have friends out there or family members who feel strongly about this and, and, and feel like they need to do something. Just keep in mind that that could be construed as indirect communication on your behalf. And uh, we will then try to uh, file, you know, or report violation of this. So just give them an extra incentive to just basically tell people to just stay away and stay quiet. Uh, so that would be my my answer to that. Awesome. Yeah, some great advice there. Let's um, talk a little bit about some other civil protections for um, survivors with uh, campus sexual assault and uh, rights available for college students and K through 12. So, so, so uh, Andrew, you want me to continue? I don't want to take over the... Sure. I, I just, if we could just pause one minute, I have one other point I wanted to make about the sexual violence protection order, just to so um, everyone's aware that a child can also seek one. So a parent would would seek the um, protection on behalf of their child or someone else on behalf of the child. And we have seen cases um, where a child is unfortunately sexually abused by another child. So these are people under 18. Um, so we have seen um, um, a sexual violence protection order being sought, you know, by a child against another child and certainly by a child um, uh, seeking it um, from maybe an adult who had, um, you know, sexually abused them. So just keep that in mind, too, that it is open um, in order to um, protect children as well. And, you know, Conrad is, um, does a lot of Title IX cases, um, so I'm going to pretty much leave that to him. But also bear in mind, as we're talking about different um, civil protections that are available, it's it's not either or. Some of these are going to overlap to be, right. you know, that could be used, um, you know, it's an and situation. So I'll let Conrad talk about Great. Title IX. Yeah, Thank so you. As, as far as uh, on-campus sexual assault, uh, this would be an example of uh, multiple protections. So we already talked about criminal charges. We talked about SVPO, which I will always uh, recommend filing one. Uh, but uh, the one that is specific to colleges and, and K-12 uh, is already mentioned Title IX uh, protection. So basically any school that is receiving uh, federal funding in any form uh, has to follow Title IX. So when it's, you know, and Title IX is very broad. We could have multiple sessions on that when it talks to just employee and employment issues, athletics, but I will focus on just this, just this topic of sexual assault where um, every campus will, should, at least, uh, as far as I know, do that as have a Title IX coordinator. We'll have a, a this day and age, we'll have a website, we'll have the school's policy will have uh, information about how to report, where to report. A lot of times you can do it online. Uh, so if I if let's say I get a phone call from someone, you know, a college student, that would be my my first recommendation would be, you know, let's report it to the Title IX's office um, because that's yet another way to hold that person accountable for what they has done to you. And again, reality is that. You know, in a lot of these cases, we do not see criminal prosecution. 
And the Title IX may be really the only way to at least hold someone accountable that where the where the victim feels like something was done, someone believed this victim, you know, there are some consequences. Uh, and uh, it's an administrative process. So basically it's internal within the university. And uh, once a complaint is filed, the Title IX officer will then have, uh, typically schools have uh, their own investigators or they will, they have someone who they outsource it to K-12 level is usually either a, a law firm that they hire or, or someone internally that they have who will investigate. And by investiga investigation, I mean, that means what, what investigation is. They will first speak with, uh, with the complainant. Um, so when we're involved, we typically will schedule a meeting either in person or Zoom, uh, or um, the complainant is asked to basically explain what happened outside of the, you know, what was in the complaint, any follow-up questions, uh, name any potential witnesses, share any evidence uh, that they may have. And of course, then investigator will speak to the, you know, what the Title IX process is called the respondent, which would be the, the accused. Uh, and uh, do the same thing. If they have witnesses, if they have evidence, they'll go through that process. Then uh, uh, at the end of the investigative process, what's, uh, what happens is uh, uh, the report, the preliminary report from the investigator is shared with both parties. And we have a chance to review and we have typically 10 days to, to comment, even supplement, because let's say you, you, this may be the first time or it's usually the first time you hear what the respondent's story is, what the witnesses are saying. And in many cases, we have something that just basically, you know, evidence that says that's not true because of something else that happened. So you may have evidence that you didn't share with investigator because it wasn't relevant at that time. But once you saw um, uh, the report and saw what's being alleged by the respondent, you may be able to share some additional evidence that basically goes after the person's credibility. Uh, once those comments are uh, submitted, uh, sometimes the investigator will do some follow-up if there are some new issues raised. Uh, other, other times it will be, you get a final report and then you, the case goes to a hearing. Uh, again, it's an administrative process. So uh, there will be a hearing officer appointed by the school. Again, some schools will get a, a panel of their employees typically they have to be trained and trauma informed etc but they, they, it's typically a panel of three or they sometimes they'll have a one single decision maker also someone from the their staff or uh, some schools outsource it and and you know i've seen some retired federal judges presiding over these mm. these cases uh and uh and they it's somewhat like a court hearing but not necessarily so it also depends on how the schools structure it so uh, the important thing is that both complainant and respondent have a right to have an advisor and that can be uh, an attorney but it doesn't have to be an attorney uh bias i'll strongly suggest getting an attorney someone who is familiar with you know title nine and the process and has done hearings and knows how to present evidence but it's also not necessarily, I'm not saying only attorneys know how to handle these cases. There are also, I, I had hearings with, with non-attorneys, advisors who did an excellent job too. Uh, but uh, um, but I also seen some cases just gone horribly wrong uh, for the respondents. So we're not really necessarily devastated by that. But, uh, but, 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 you know, that's, I'm not here to talk about respondents. Um, and then, uh, then once you have a hearing and the decision is made, the, the uh, burden of proof again under Title IX, the school has to either has to adopt either preponderance of the evidence or clear and convincing evidence standard, which is higher, uh, as long as they have it officially in their policy and it's uniformly applied to these cases, they can do either. Most of the time, I'm, I'm yet to run into clear and convincing evidence. Most of the time, it's preponderance of the evidence, uh, and, and again, that's when like to illustrate it, like 51% or the, again, the scale tips towards you, the evidentiary scale, scale tips towards you. And then uh, the panel or the decision maker uh, will make a decision. And, you know, it's either they find the respondent responsible for the alleged acts or, or not responsible. Uh, if uh, a respondent is found responsible, then 
Um, it depends also on the school. Sometimes the decision maker immediately will issue the sanctions. Uh, uh, there are some schools where we actually, after the hearing, we waited for the panel to deliberate, announce their decision while we just were in the waiting room on Zoom, and then we went to uh, the, the the sanctions uh, stage where that was an opportunity. I like that because there was an opportunity for uh, for a client to do the impact statement and just express basically directly to to that person what they have done to to uh, the victim and uh, what the impact it had on the victim's life. Uh, I found it very uh, meaningful. Uh, to, to clients, it's, it's almost seems like that weight was like lifted of their shoulder. Uh, and as far as the sanctions, I mean, it also depends on the school. I mean, the schools can kick somebody out. They, they can and just, you know, permanently. People are just not allowed to return on campus ever again uh, in any form, uh, seek employment in the future, et cetera. Uh, they have suspensions for a number of semesters with the uh, possibility of re-enrollment. But, uh, you know, I never really ran into someone re-enrolling. I'm not sure what the criteria is. I would hope that the school, having been on notice of, of the conduct for which someone was found responsible, would be hesitant to re-enroll just because that kind of makes them, just from purely legal perspective, makes them liable for, for that person's acts. Um, and then there are additional, other than that, I mean, people have to do modules on, on, on you know, consent, people have to go to get uh, evaluations and, and, and uh, follow any uh, treatment recommendations, uh, et cetera. So I think in a nutshell, that's, you know, that's, that's a remedy. Again, SVPO, I would still file. Sometimes it's helpful if the person wants a hearing, that's an opportunity for me to cross-examine them and get their statement on the record because Title IX can take some months. By the time they may be talking to an investigator, uh, they for, they forget uh, what they, uh, I'll say it, lied about in court. <laughs> and uh, then there is a different story. So if you see they're completely two inconsistent statements, you can pull the transcript from, from the court proceeding and then use it at the Title IX hearing. Uh, and just one quick note on Title IX. Uh, I've seen cases where Title IX hearing was then, um, a, or the transcript, even the video of the hearing was requested by law enforcement. They have to get a search warrant because of the confidentiality, but they will get the, you know, they will get a search warrant and, and get the university college to release uh, the record of the proceeding. And, uh, and one particular case that sticks in my mind is, that Title IX hearing was exactly what convinced the law enforcement to file charges, because at the end of the hearing, uh, he apologized and took ownership, and that was an admission. Uh, up until that point, the law enforcement was not uh, really too eager to, to pursue that case, and that case is now pending, and uh, I think they're negotiating a plea agreement. That's interesting. Um, someone's asking if Title IX follows um, similar guidelines like CPS or CYF for children and youth. I would say not really, but um, maybe um, to the extent that um, you can get like a reasonable accommodation. Talk a little bit about that and let's see if, if that answers the question. If not, Keisha, please put in a follow up. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for mentioning it because that's a that's a big point I I missed there. That that the moment you file a complaint, even if you don't file a complaint, like let's say you talk to your Title IX officer, decide that you don't want to file, but under Title IX you can the school should provide you with reasonable accommodations, which you know in the college setting, it could be a number of things. So let's say you have. A, finals coming and you just need some extra time and to reschedule or some, some accommodations maybe, you know, to just take them without people in the room, you know, uh, if it's, you know, finals is one example, but if you're just during the semester, if you just cannot get out of your dorm and just, uh, you know, or, or you have to be in court or you have to meet an attorney or, or you have to see a therapist and it's conflicts with your uh, schedule, uh, the you know the school should accommodate and and make sure you don't get you know that that's not used against you some 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 professors have strict attendance record or or policies i should say uh 
also uh when it comes to housing sometimes you know with the dorm location if, if you're in the same dorm um or the the same building as the perpetrator uh you can request um just you know to be moved somewhere else or preferably the dead person be moved somewhere else that's what we'll typically will ask for first uh re fairly recently i had i had a client that was asking to be allowed to live off campus um uh as a basically i think uh, a sophomore which was against the school policy the school uh required that all freshmen and sophomores stay on campus but uh because of the title IX process and the and the uh the complaint being filed the school did uh grant that request and and, and the client was able to move off campus uh so this is this is just a number of course like there are resources on campus counseling you know the school should title nine should inform you of those that's also you know uh protective measures as far as being able to uh to see a counselor and not worrying about the uh you know spending money in the process and uh, and also i mean confidentiality just worth emphasizing that basically title nine you file a complaint both parties are immediately instructed that uh, this is confidential you cannot really share information uh, they'll issue no contact uh directive so basically it's somewhat similar like you know svpo but not I, that's why i always recommend filing svpo because that directive if it's violated it just results in like a, another disciplinary proceeding with the school uh while svpo you report it to law enforcement and you know uh that person again is facing jail time so the, the just has more uh teeth if you will uh than 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 what the title nine can provide oh, Okay, great. I see we have one last question. Looks like um, an instance with a child offender. Is there an age limit where a child can be charged? And I'm assuming that that's criminal charges, the question? Yeah. I mean, this is, uh, I would like to know how Susanna Conrad would respond. I would say practically, yes. Um, there are times that you know, if if um, we've had several cases where um, one child sexually abused another child while in school, and we're talking like, you know, their third graders, fourth graders, um, you know, the prosecutor oftentimes is not going to want to charge the offending child for a number of different reasons. Um, we've also had that same situation occur, um, and both children had some level of disability. Um, and, you know, the prosecutor was not going to, um, pursue, you know, juvenile justice, um, with respect to the offending child. And of course, you know, at PCAR, we're all about prevention too. And it certainly raises the question when you have one small child who is, um, um, this is, um, you know, having this problematic behavior that's resulting in essentially an assault of another child, you know, what, where is that child getting that from? You know, are they too a victim? Um, it's very disturbing. But I, I wondered if um, Conrad or Suzanne had a different thought. No, I don't. I I, I agree with with what you presented there. Um, yeah, I think especially when you're talking about young children, that you will see um, the system tries to see a kind of like what can be done for the benefit of both. Of the children when there's the offensive child and the, the child victim they are really looking at both of them because the age is so young um i see there's another question about um what's the recourse on, on title nine when the school refuses um to accommodate um i would say there are two options there one would be filing with um Office of Civil Rights, uh, referred to, uh, commonly referred to as OCR, uh, within the Department of Education on the federal level. So uh, they have district offices. So, for example, like you're a Pennsylvania resident, there is an office in Philadelphia. If you file a complaint with them, and they basically they oversee compliance. Um, so you can report that the you know the. The issue with OCR is that uh, you have to be prepared for a lengthy uh, process. 
and I'm not saying that to discourage because at the same time, you know, yeah, it's you can be filing as a sophomore and the case is not final finalized until after you graduate. However, if OCR is going to hold them accountable and change policies and make them pay attention and get refreshed on Title IX, it's definitely worth it. So I always, of course, we leave it up to clients. I will always say it's going to take a while, but it's worth it and and, and let's file it. Uh, and the other option is just, um, uh, you know, the violations are just basically like blatant and they just completely do not care, do not follow Title IX, um, just considering a civil lawsuit under Title IX in federal court against uh, against a particular school. Um, that's something, I mean, we introduced our projects we do we you know typically we do not do those but uh, uh well not typically we cannot see we cannot seek money damages um or we cannot sue for money damages so that's one of the things we're not funded for but uh but we'll refer to attorneys that uh, that are experienced and uh, and I'm sure people themselves can find someone who has experience in the, this area of law Right. I think it's also worth mentioning um, when we talk about like the victim's rights and the accommodation for the victim, that um, the Title IX does require the accommodation, but it does not say that the accommodation has to be exactly what the victim wants. So sometimes we see people kind of get crossed up in that, like they want it to be this, the school offers this, which is still an accommodation, um, but it doesn't really require them to get the exact accommodation that they request or that they want. So that's kind of a, another challenging piece. Yeah, but it's the reasonable parts and the reasonable accommodations. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Sometimes you have a small school and it has one dorm building. It, it, obviously the school, you know, and it's full, they can only do so much to move you and that's not going to be considered a violation just as, a, as an example. Yeah, one cafeteria, things like that make it a challenge. But this this conversation has been great. We so appreciate it. Um, Andrea, if you want to um, tell us how uh, survivors could contact the program and we could get that typed into the chat. So if people are, are needing legal representation, um, they could know that process. Uh, there are two main ways to contact the Sexual Violence Legal Assistance Project at the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape. We receive um, many of our inquiries just on the telephone or telephone number 717-901-6784. Um, you, a person would call in. Um, we need, we are a law office, so we need to do a conflicts check. Um, and then we have an intake process to understand what the request is from the survivor. Um, thereafter, it is assigned to a lawyer who evaluates um, in more detail what services, if any, that we are able to provide you. Um, the other way to reach the project is if you go on to PCAR.org, which is our website, and click on, um, I think it's Talk to a Lawyer Today um, link, and you scroll to the uh, bottom of the page, there's a little online form that you can like type in your name, your email address, your phone number. Um, just a, one or two sentences about um, what what your problem is, um, or just say, "Hey, can you contact me?" And um, someone from our office will get a hold of you. Um, we're happy to help. Um, we do have limitations as to what we can do based on the grants, as Conrad was saying. We cannot sue for a monetary damage award in any event. Um, but um, if you if there's a chance that you think that we could help, please reach out. We would love to. Um, hear from you and or you know members of the community that you know who might need our help i just wanted to mention one thing that we didn't and i think it's very important we do not have any income uh criteria requirements because a lot of legal aid uh places they they, they have minimum income requirements so we do not look at income or uh, that's not even part we part of some thing that we consider yeah, and that's such a great point. Thank you, Conrad, for um, saying that. Um, the other part is the person. Sometimes we have people call in for a survivor, you know. But we need to this. We need to speak to the survivor directly to establish the attorney-client relationship. You know, unless the survivor is a child, of course. But um, so if the survivor themselves could call in, that's how we can really get the ball rolling. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you all for joining the conversation today. 
Thank you for everything that you do to uplift survivors and to elevate um, victims' rights. Uh, if you have any other questions or needs, please feel free to contact the Office of Victim Advocate. We'd be happy to help you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Take care.